book of Romans chapter 6. We are in lesson 6 and we're calling it dying to self. Romans chapter 6, lesson 6, I'm going to talk about dying to self. Let me give you the overview of the lesson today. God desires for each one of us to enjoy the victorious Christian life. It is a vital element of building below the baseline in our Christian living. Yet many struggle through their Christian life. The equation for victorious Christian living is found in Romans chapter 6. And many of you have memorized the verse in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. It is as we understand that our old nature is crucified with Christ, that we yield to the Holy Spirit and we are then able to access this victory which is in Jesus Christ. We're going to read some verses in Romans 6 here in just a second, but let me introduce it by saying that it is filled with basic and necessary instructions for believers. It is like a driver's manual for the Christian life. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans expounding upon the gift of salvation and all that it entails. This book teaches the great doctrine of justification, the doctrine of sanctification, and the doctrine of glorification. It begins with explaining our need for a Savior. Just think about it like in Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no not one and we talk about the need for Jesus there in the beginning of the book salvation by faith and that we are justified in the sight of God then as we come to chapter 6 through 8 we are introduced to the next result of our salvation which is sanctification or being made more like Christ now there's two words that I want to give you that I've already mentioned the first one is going to be put up on the screen called justification and I want to give you a brief definition of what justification is. Justification releases us from the penalty of sin through Christ's substitution. Now please understand that statement because it is telling us that we are not saved based upon works of righteousness which we can do, but we are saved according to the mercy of Jesus Christ and the fact that He went to the cross for us. The next word we want to see on the screen is sanctification. Sanctification releases us from the control of sin so we may live freely in righteousness. And I love those two definitions for both of those words and therefore I want to show you what chapter 5 of the book of Romans is like and then I'll show you what chapter 6 is. So chapter 5, you could break it down by looking at chapter 5 being justification. In chapter 5 you could see number 1, Christ died for us. Number 2, the substitution of Christ. Number 3, that Christ died for sins. Number 4, that He paid sin's penalty. And number five, that righteousness is imputed to us. But then in Romans chapter 6, you see the difference from justification to sanctification. Romans 6, number one, we died with Christ. Number two, we identify with Christ. Number three, Christ died unto sin. Number four, he broke sin's power. And number five, righteousness is imparted. So chapter five, we deal with justification. Chapter six, we deal with sanctification. Again, I want to see those definitions for justification. Justification releases us from the penalty of sin through Christ submission and then the word sanctification sanctification releases us from the control of sin so we may live freely in righteousness you know you think about it Paul is describing the incredible forgiveness that is available through salvation in Jesus Christ and we've seen it here at church we've seen people young see the forgiveness of Jesus Christ we have also seen people well worn in the ruggedness of a sinful lifestyle come to Jesus Christ and everybody in between. We are thankful today that no matter the situation, no matter where people have come from 
no matter the color, we see the realization of the power of forgiveness that all men everywhere can be saved. This brings us to an area of our Christian life that no one else can see, the sanctification. Are we allowing God's grace to motivate us to die to self and then to live for Christ? Or are we quietly and privately engaging in sin, claiming then the grace of God in our life? If we desire to build below the baseline a foundation that is unmovable in the name of Jesus, we must learn to die to self. And that is the title of today's lesson, Dying to Self. Number one, let's talk about a presumption to avoid. A presumption to avoid. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In verse number 2, say the first two words with me. God forbid. Then it says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, Romans 5 closes with a glorious pronouncement. Where sin abounded, in verse 20, grace did much more abound. What a liberating... What a freeing truth that no matter how ugly our sin is, God's grace is greater. And I think about it leading into Romans chapter 6, then beginning with the fact that there are those who would look at the Christian life and say, I can live however I want to, I am saved. I can live however I choose, I have the grace of God. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Our world ridicules holy living, and some Christians have been so influenced by worldly philosophies that they ridicule ridicule holiness and they ridicule growth that is through Jesus Christ. In truth, all they, although they are emphasizing the grace of God, they are then using the grace of God for something that is allowing them to sin or not be like Christ. And that is not what Romans chapter 6 is talking about. Romans chapter 6 is showing us that the grace grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and to live soberly, righteously, and justly in this present world, like Titus says. Now look at this, letter A, a problem of interpretation. Paul pointed out two problems with abusing God's grace. Now the problem of interpretation that we are dealing with is how some people interpret grace as a license to sin. Some choose to think that if grace abounds when sin abounds, then the more that we sin, the more that we will receive grace. In other words, grace minus the law equals a license to live how I want to. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. A growing Christian ought to study God's Word, all of it, and rightly gather and implement the truths of God's Holy Word to be able to see the whole counsel of God and to be able to apply it to their life. As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, God is saying, my word has been given to bring people that are saved unto a perfect man. Not unto a man that continues in sin. Not unto a person that says, I can do this and get away with it because of God's grace. But God is anticipating that through His Word and its power that we are going to make a move to be more Christ-like, to be holy even as He is holy. Let her be 
There's a problem of intention. So letter A, there's a problem with interpretation considering the grace of God. And then letter B, there's a problem with intention. Many who wrongly presume they can freely live in sin do so because of a heart problem within. They live with their sin in their lives not because they are naively misinterpreting the Bible. They misinterpret the Bible because of the intentions of their hearts that are wrong. God's Word is the tool that God uses to show us the truth about our intentions. We must rely on God's Word to expose the hidden motives of our hearts not to misinterpret and to excuse them. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But when we put the word in, we're going to have to come to grips with this reality. The word is going to show us where we're wrong. The word is going to correct us. The word is going to say, okay, you've got a choice to make, a move to God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ or a move away in that sin and therefore a need to confess it and forsake it and live for the glory of God. I think of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Many of you have that verse memorized as well. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Man, when I get underneath the preaching of the word of God and as this book is preached, regardless of who's preaching, it, it is amazing to me how the Spirit of God speaks to me about what I am going through right now. Maybe it's the need to be corrected. Maybe it's the need to be guided. Maybe it's the need to be comforted. I don't know what you're going through, but it is amazing to me how with each one that's in here today, you can be going through something different, having done something different, or stepping back from doing something you should, and the Spirit of God knows how to take the Word of God and speak to every single one of us in our situation. And get this, even if it's a husband and wife or parents and children and they sit underneath this and they're all kind of going through the same circumstance, isn't it good to know that God knows exactly how to speak to the one who needs this in the family and speak to the one who needs that in the family and speak to the others who need this in the family and God knows exactly how to give it all out as we need it. We've got a good God who wants to take his word today and teach us the truth. Listen, a Christian who insists on living apart from the holiness commanded in God's word will stand on the basic truth that they can use the grace of God and continue in their sin. But we look again at what we read in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says it like this, God forbid. He wasn't going around teaching now that you're saved and now that you have God's grace live in whatever way you want to but that tends to be a trend of those who are worldly in their Christianity carnal in their Christianity and it doesn't matter the name of the sign on which they go to church we all can have a philosophy like this if we're not careful the phrase, God forbid, is like saying, no way. In fact, it's the strongest idiom in the Greek for the denial of something. The correct way to enjoy God's grace is not only to recognize its liberation, its freeing power, but also to recognize its purification. You see, grace purifies and God's grace liberates us from sin and gives us the power to say no to temptation and fleshly living. But you know how it can be. In that moment of temptation, it can be a huge struggle. It can seem as if war is on the very horizon and there needs to be a situation where you jump in the trench and take cover and rest in the arms of God's grace which teaches us that the Denying ungodliness, we should live in a certain way for God in this present world. Now, as I think about God's grace, 
I think about Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 13, which says, For brethren, ye have not been called unto liberty, or ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. God has given us liberty, not the liberty to sin, but the liberty to serve. Now, here's an illustration about Amazing Grace. It's probably one of the more popular hymns. The author of the song is a man by the name of John Newton, 1725 to 1807. Newton was a slave trader and an alcoholic. He got saved. He became a preacher and led uh, the movement to end slavery. John Newton has experienced the redeeming grace through salvation and applied the purification of grace. The words he penned testify of this experience. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." John Newton had rightly applied God's grace to his life. He understood that the grace that covers sin is the same grace that is present when we are convicted by God not to commit sin. The wonderful grace of Jesus not only justifies our soul, but it sanctifies it. Grace is an amazing work of the Holy Spirit that conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. So God forbid that we should abuse grace. May we understand the need to say no way to sin because I am forgiven, because I am under grace. Number two, I want you to see a position to acknowledge. A position to acknowledge. First of all, we looked at the presumption to avoid. We need to avoid the problem of interpretation and the problem with intention. And then now we want to talk about a position to acknowledge. Listen, the incredible truth about salvation is that we are in Christ. When somebody is an alcoholic, they are in the destruction of the alcohol. When somebody is in any addiction, they are in it, they are drowning in it, they are immersed in it, it is taking them under. And you understand that addictions, when you are in those, they are suffocating the very peace of life. They are suffocating the very outcome of what life's intention is. But listen, when you are in Christ, there is not death or destruction. There is life. And God intends there to be the blooming and the growth that is found through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So here's the question. What are we involved in? Who are we in as well? And so we think about truth. The truth of salvation is we are in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You know, this passage we often associate and include as it teaches about water baptism and how water baptism by immersion pictures that when we are saved, we are completely immersed in Christ. Throughout scripture, we see the teaching, especially obviously, in the New Testament that in Christ that through his death, his burial and his resurrection is a picture of what takes place in us when we believe the gospel of Christ. And therefore that is why we practice that baptism as we're going to talk about a little while today. Furthermore, just as he arose from the grave we are alive in him, free to walk in newness of life. R.A. Torrey explained it in this way. When Jesus died, he died as my representative, and I died in him. When he arose, 
He arose as my representative, and I arose in him. When he ascended up on high and took his place at the right hand of the Father in glory, he ascended as my representative, and I ascended in him. And today I am seated in Christ with God in the heavenlies, as we know Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. I look at the cross of Christ, and I know that atonement has been made for my my sins. I look at the open sepulcher and the risen and ascended Lord, and I know that the atonement has been accepted, that no longer, there no longer remains a single sin in me, no matter how many or how great my sins have been. And what a liberating truth. And let's break it down. Letter A, crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. One of the most concise declarations of what it means to be in Christ is found in Galatians 2.20. I'm going to look at it with you. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. The Bible says, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, our old man, our sin nature was crucified with Christ. Let's go back to Romans chapter 6 and let's look at as we continue in this chapter of sanctification to understand understand that our old man, our sin nature, was crucified with Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Here it is, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So as you look at verse number 6 of Romans chapter 6 in the Sunday school today, there's the teaching and the understanding that because of Christ's crucifixion and my submission to that doctrine by belief, then my old man has been crucified with him. He was the final sacrifice for the atonement of sin. God's perfect lamb and the spotless lamb was offered once for all as we looked at last week in the teaching of the priesthood of the believer. Those who by faith have received Christ as the payment for their sins have had their old man nailed to the cross. Their evil uh, propensities of all the wickedness and extremities of the old man has been conquered. And we as the body of Christ can receive Rejoice in the fact that today we have been saved from our sin and set free from our sin. And that causes us to rejoice in him. And we are very thankful for the presence of the new man which is created in Christ Jesus. You see, the cross destroys the body of sin. It rendered sin inoperable. This is what Galatians 2.20 means when it says, I am crucified with Christ. Living in the old nature is not supposed to be the normal for Christian living. God never intended for us to live in the continuing bondage of sin after our salvation. We still have the ability to choose sin, but we do not have the nature of sin like we did before we were crucified with Christ. Lester Roloff, 1914, 1982, was a preacher and an evangelist. He had once had a man apologize to him for having stated things that attacked his character and motive. Lester Roloff's response was, you can't hurt a dead man. He understood that he was dead to sin and didn't have to hold a grudge. For every Christian, the position to acknowledge is that our old man is crucified with Christ. Let her be, they're buried with Christ. Not only do we need to see that we are dead with Christ or crucified with Christ, but we are buried with Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 3 and 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Our old man 
was buried with Christ. And this is where it's supposed to be remaining. But for some reason, we like to dig up the dead. We like to bring it back into our life. And our flesh and that carnality desires the things that it should not. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There ought to be a desire to live the faith in him. We wrestle so much against the tendencies of the old man, the old past patterns that we wrestle against him to overcome. Maybe it's a sharp tongue, bitterness, an angry spirit, a proud heart, or acting in ways that we should not and know we should. This sin nature has been rendered useless at the cross. It has been dead because of the crucifixion. It has been buried, expected to never battle in this life again. And every Christian should acknowledge that their old man is Buried with Christ. Letter C, raised with Christ. At the end of verse 4, we read uh, that we should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. We think about being raised. Not only did our old man die with Christ, but we are alive in Christ. We have been given a new nature. Verse 4 tells us that we should walk in the newness of life. And that's what baptism reminds us of every time somebody submits to that teaching of Jesus Christ. The Christian life, the new life, it isn't our life, but rather it's Christ's life living through us. And again, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We are to be dead to the things of this world that was once occupying our flesh. And we are to be alive under the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in and through us. Number three, I want to talk about a process to activate a process to activate. I want you to think about Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 3 where the Bible teaches a Christian for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. This is our present standing in him. We are presently dead to the old man but our life is hid with Christ in God. This is our position in him. 2 Corinthians 5 17 therefore if any man be in Christ he is a what? New creature. Sure, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See, as we think about a process to activate, and we have looked at the biblical facts of the Christian life, that in Christ we are dead to sin and alive to God, we have a responsibility to live according to those facts. So we talk about the process to activate. Someone once heard about an elderly woman, woman who died in an old shack, having lived there in severe poverty. After her death, however, distant relatives were surprised to learn that she had hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. Although the fact was that she had the resources to live in luxury, she didn't live according to that fact, either through ignorance or through being frugal in this life. Now listen, what a tragic thing when a Christian who has Christ's power within to live a victorious Christian life does not live according to that fact, but instead lives according to the old nature. 
My grandma told us that we actually had somebody in our family that was like that once in Ohio. That when he passed away, it wasn't that he had thousands in the bank. He had it in, in, in uh, grocery sacks within his home, just all over the place, didn't believe in banks. He had as well the opportunity to live in a different manner, but he chose not to. Listen, Christian, let us understand that we are missing a phenomenal opportunity in the Christian life. When Christ died for us and rose again that we may walk in newness. We're missing an opportunity to show the world Christ in us, Christ through us, the hope of glory. People need to know that we know Jesus. And genuinely, in a humble way as we live this life, may they see grace abound through our testimony. I think again of Galatians chapter 2.20 as we recite it again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, a present understanding, I live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8. For ye were some times darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. What a command. What an understanding. We are not partly light and partly dark. We are not partly dead and partly alive. We have a responsibility to activate the life, the light within. And that's why the Bible said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. A responsibility to shine. Listen, rather than walking in the flesh, let's walk in the spirit. Rather than walking in the old man, let's walk in the new man. Now, as we talk about this process to activate, let's letter A, reckon. Letter A, reckon. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 11. The Bible says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. The process to activate begins first of all by reckoning yourselves to be dead unto sin. The word reckon means to take into account, to calculate. If you are a, a family that has a budget, what you are going to do at the beginning of the month is you're going to sit down and you're going to reckon, you're going to take into account and call to calculate what it is that you presently have at your resources that are available and what it is that you are looking to take in. And as you look to know the situation, you will then look to execute accordingly. And when I think about this verse, to reckon myself dead unto sin, I am to take Take it into account to know. I am to calculate the fact that I am no longer living to sin, but I am living to Christ in Christ. To say that the old man is crucified is one thing, but to reckon it is another. It is not enough merely to know our position in Christ. We must by faith reckon it to be true in our own individual lives. We must begin each and every day by reckoning our position in Christ. As I think about letter A, reckon, I also want to think about letter B, yield. Look with me at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 13. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 13. The Bible says, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. When somebody pulls a trumpet out of the case and begins to play the trumpet, it's going to sound like a trumpet. When somebody pulls a violin out of its case and begins to strike the chord, supposing that it's in tune, it's going to sound like a violin or it's going to sound like a violin out of tune. When you pull a certain instrument out and play it, it ought to sound like what it is. And in a believer's life, as we activate the yielding, we are then going to reveal that we are instruments of the Lord's righteousness and that the sound that is heard is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But it will only begin when we reckon and when we yield. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 12. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal, mortal, mortal body. I remember a couple of years ago when Brother Lynn Potts was here, uh, he was teaching our children about, uh, you know, obeying some things and obeying parents and obeying this. And we had just had a conversation that went along these lines. Stop it. And so Brother Potts after that, you know, anytime it was kind of a joke around our house. Stop it. We'd say it just like that. Stop it. And I think about Romans chapter 6 and verse number 12. When I understand that there's something reigning in my mortal body called sin, you know what I just need to do? I just need to, like Brother Lynn Potts would say, stop it. I need to stop doing that. Just let it go in my life. The Christian doesn't have to let sin reign in. You know why? Because of Christ. We don't have to live that way. We don't have to let sin be in control of our life. In Christ, the enthronement of self ends. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, those famous verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed unto this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As you look back to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 12 and 13, look more at 13 where it says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. I may ask you today, are your hands clean before God? And we're going to have a Lord's Supper after a while. And one of the big things about that is examining yourself. Now I may ask you, are your hands clean? You know, have you done anything that you should not have done? Are they clean? Okay, well maybe they're clean. What about your heart? Is your heart clean before God? Are your eyes clean before God? What about your mind, your feet? Where have you gone? Are you clean before Him? We have the opportunity in Christ to live for His glory. Sin, Satan, and our flesh will always be around this side of eternity. But the crucifixion of the old self, sin's power over us, it's broken. We commit sin when we act independently of God's presence in our life. We must recognize that we cannot live independently of God and have victory in our lives. The positive admonition is to make our members available unto the Lord, to live as righteous instruments for His honor and glory through His power in His hands. We can serve this righteousness because we are alive in Christ. Someone who habitually struggles to live victoriously may say, I don't know why the old man takes over. I don't know why the old flesh wins. The answer lies in our choices. To whom we yield ourselves to obey and to whom we yield ourselves will be the one we love. Let us purpose today then to die to self and live in the victory that is in Jesus. Spiritual victory. We don't have to have defeat. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we thank you for the fact that you give your grace and you give your mercy. We are thankful today and we realize that we don't deserve it. But Lord, I pray that we would understand that the old man is dead and that we would live in your righteousness and yield ourselves as servants to obey you. Thank you for this grace. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people pray and say,